Glad you are with us in service today. Um, let us start with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your blessings to us. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to be in your house today. And we just ask that, uh, Lord, as we've gathered together, that uh, you would meet with us. We ask, Lord, how your Holy Spirit would come and work and move in every single one of our hearts, Lord, today. We pray, Lord, if there's one who needs salvation, Lord, that today would be the day they understand how they need Christ as Savior and Lord, and they would repent and trust Christ. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, every believer here, Lord, that you would encourage our hearts today. Lord, if there's things in our life that we need to repent of, how I pray that uh, this would also be the day that we return to you. Um, and so, Lord, we just thank you for what you're going to do in this service. We just pray your blessings on, uh, on all the aspects of service today. Lord, bless your music and, and all that takes place. Be glorified, Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, just a few announcements. Um, Wednesday night, our dinner's going to be, uh, Brandy and Miss Tammy have a few leftovers that are frozen, so they're going to do a leftover night, and it's going to be pulled pork or chicken spaghetti, so you can have either or. Just let them know if you plan on coming. Also, don't forget, next week, the Teagues are coming. There are missionaries in France. Um, they'll be talking in the AM service, so we want you here for that. And then Saul Sunday is September the 8th. We will have lunch afterwards that morning, and then no PM service. We've got uh, Ladies Movie Night, which is going to be on the 12th at 6.30 in the WOW room in our women's room, and it's BYOD, Bring Your Own Dinner, and then we'll have a movie um, during. And then Master's Men is on the 15th at 7.30 in the morning in the Family Life Center. All men are invited to that. They will be eating breakfast like they always do, um, so you're invited. All right, if you will, please stand as our praise team comes. Good morning. Would you sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name?
uh, just one other announcement, kind of in conjunction with next weekend. Don't forget, uh, with the Teagues being with us, Dennis and Carol, our missionaries from France, which we are very excited about them being with us in service next week. Uh, we will have regular Sunday school uh, next Sunday, regular services both Sunday morning and Sunday night next week. The only thing that will change will be on the 8th. We will uh, not having the evening service that day. So just uh, keep that in mind if you would. All right, let's have our ushers come forward and we'll receive our morning tithes and offerings. Ask Steve Wood if he'd lead us, please. Would you stand once more as we sing Blessed Be the Name and remain standing as we sing Amazing Grace. <laughs> Set free by God, my Savior. 
Well, this morning I want to talk to us about God's amazing grace. It is fitting that we sang that particular hymn or that version of that hymn. Um, I, I want us to think about this question, where would we be without the grace of God? Where would any of us be without the grace of God? Um, I think it would be safe to say that we all know that we would probably all be in a very bad way. Because without God's grace, we would forever be lost. Without God's grace, we would forever be hopeless. Without God's grace, we would forever be in our sins. We would forever be dead in our sins. We would forever be separated from God because of our sins. But by God's grace, everything is different. Um, what is the grace of God? Well, let me give us just a couple things to think about as we think about the grace of God. Number one is that God is gracious. It's who he is, right? It's part of his character. It's his nature. Just like God is holy and God is just and God is kind and he is righteous, and he is merciful, he is also gracious. It's who he is. One writer said, a second thing is, he says, grace is closely related to God's benevolence, which is a kind act, or kind acts. It's, it's closely related to not only benevolence, but love and mercy. God's grace is showing, basically the idea of grace is that it's, it's God showing us undeserved favor. And again, it's undeserved. I like what one writer said. He said, in his grace, God is willing to forgive us and bless us abundantly in spite of the fact that we don't deserve to be treated so well or dealt with so generously. Now, I, I have to, we have to deal with a couple of things up front as we think about God's grace. Because some take the grace of God and some take the love of God and they want to say because God is gracious and because God is loving, well, that just simply means that then he's just going to let everybody in to heaven. So it's just going to, he's just, he'll, he'll let that whole sin thing, he'll just kind of let it go to the wayside and he'll just let everybody in because God is love. 
God is gracious. I have to tell us today that's not true. That's called universalism. Now, if you was to walk up to somebody, they may not know what that term means. But if, you, if you're talking with someone and they're like, oh, God's going to let everybody, he'll, he's gracious and loving and kind. He's going to let everybody in. Well, then that's universalism, whether they know that term or not. And that's not true. Because if that was the case, Jesus never had to come. He never had to die. He never had to take upon the sin of the world upon himself if God was just going to let everybody in. A second thing is people want to say, well, we know that Jesus came and he died, and he died for the sins of the world. Well, because since Jesus died for the sins of the world upon the cross, well, then that means that everything's good and God's going to let everybody in. And that is not true either. Because you see, salvation is a gift. And if I have a gift for you, but you never receive that gift, that gift does not benefit you because you didn't take it. If a person does not receive, if they don't repent and place their faith in Christ, then, the, then, then they don't have the forgiveness of sins. They, they don't have eternal life. You see, God's grace does not mean that God allows any and everything. God's grace does not mean that God does not punish sin. God's grace does not mean that hell does not exist. What God's grace does say, let me give you some, some verses here as we think about this topic of God's amazing grace. Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. What would that be? That's repentance. Return. That's what repentance is. It's, re it's, it's to turn. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon that's grace. Romans 5 8 says, but, but God shows His love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That famous verse that most people know, whether they are really believers or not, seems to be John 3 16, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Life. And even at the end of the scriptures, when you get to Revelation, in Revelation twenty two seventeen, 17, he says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty, Come. Let the one who desires to take of the water of life without price. All those verses are chalked full of the grace of God. So this morning I want us to, to, to take the word grace and use it as an acrostic as we think about God's amazing grace. First of all is God's great grace. We see God's great grace uh, in His church in Acts 4.33. The sermon is mine, but I, had, I, I did find this acrostic, and I want to use it, so uh, full disclosure. The sermon's mine, just the outline, as far as the G-R-A-C-E. Uh, we see God's great grace in His church. Acts 4.33 says, And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So, so two things I want us to note here in this verse as we think about God's great grace. One is we see that God showed His grace to the apostles by giving them great power as they witnessed for Jesus. 
And, 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 and we, we, we know this, we, we see this, when you, especially when you read through the book of Acts and other places where, where God just did these unbelievable things with the apostles. But, but I want us to notice the, the second, the, 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 the little phrase that comes at the end. Because Luke records for us that not only does God show His great grace to those apostles in the first century, but then He says, and great grace was upon them all. That's the church. That's the believers. God's great grace was not just for the prophets, right? It wasn't just for Isaiah or Jeremiah. It wasn't just for the apostles of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and all the others. It's for every believer. Everyone, if you're, if you're in Christ, it's for you and for me. And he gave them this grace as they shared the gospel. He gave them this grace to live faithfully for Jesus. And, and, and we need to remember, boy, they, were, they lived in some what we would call some dark times just like we do. They lived in cultures that were just as pagan as ours is. Yes, you live in a pagan culture. Hope that's not a newsflash to you. America has become a pagan culture. And yet in the midst of that culture they lived in, by God's great grace, they lived for Jesus. And by God's great grace, we live for Jesus. The second thing we see is God's redeeming grace. If you're saved, I just want to remind us, as I often do, what God saved us from. Um, I like what I like how one writer put it. He and all these all these descriptions he used have scripture references, but I won't give you all the references here. But just listen to how he worded it. He said, "We were born in sin, and we were guilty of breaking God's holy laws. We were enemies of God, deserving of death. We were unrighteous, and without means of justifying ourselves." Spiritually, we were destitute, blind, unclean, and dead. Our souls were in peril of everlasting punishment. But then he says these four words. But then came grace. Then came grace. You see, God's redeeming grace brings pardon and purity and peace and purpose to us. Even though we deserve to die, both physically and spiritually, grace comes and says, I will give you life. And even though we die physically, we have the promise of resurrection. We have that promise that, that this body, even though it's going to be put into a grave, that there's a day coming when that body will be resurrected and that resurrected body will be changed. And that in that, in that change, the, the spirit that we have is rejoined with that resurrected body and we will then be forever with Christ. It's because of God's redeeming grace. Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5 says, But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. How? And by grace you have been saved. Paul tells us that we are saved by grace. He goes on to say in these famous verses, we all know so well, verses 8 and 9 for, of chapter 2, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation, as he said again, is a gift of God. It is not by your good works. It is not by my good works. There is nothing that we have ever thought, said, or done that made God sit up and go, Wow, I've got to save that one. It's, none of, it's nothing of us. Because we're just, before Jesus, literally, we are wretched sinners. That's why we need salvation. So I want to tell you, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, oh, please hear me today. That if you've never been saved, if you have never repented of sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, I want to tell you that God's redeeming grace is for you. Just like it was for everyone in this, that's in this room who knows Jesus as Savior. It's like I always like to say, we are exactly where you are. Right? We were in that place where we're hearing this thing about Jesus and we're hearing this thing about salvation and we're hearing maybe for the first time that, wow, because of the things I do, but because I was born in sin and I commit sin, that because of those things it has separated me from God. And now this guy is standing up there telling me that there is one person who can bring me back to God and that's this man named Jesus Christ. There's a time when all of us had to hear that message for the first time. And I just want to tell you that God's redeeming grace extends to you like He did it to us. A third thing we see is God's abundant grace. If we continue into Ephesians 2 a little bit, verses 6 and 7, He says, And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So Paul tells us that in eternity, God will show us through kindness just how gracious He is. Now just, just let that sink in. And Paul gives us that little word. He says it's immeasurable. You, you can't put it in a cup and measure it. It's abundant. It means that there's an abundance of grace available and that God will give it generously. But it's not just for eternity. Not only is God's grace going to be shown to us in kindness in eternity, but God's grace is available now in this life. Ephesians 1, 12 through 15, Paul is, is, is thinking about, as he's, he's introdu introducing this letter that he has for the Ephesians as he's thinking about who he was and who he is now, this is what he says. He says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was, now listen, so this is Paul. So formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord, catch this, overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Then he says, this, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. So let's just take it for a moment that, that Paul really was the worst one ever. Right? That's what he's saying. Boy, when it comes to being the sinner, I was at the top of the list. And yet what happened? God's grace was extended to him. 
So if, if Paul, which he wasn't, but let's just say Paul was the worst one of the bunch. So what that means is that if God's grace can extend to him, then it can extend to anybody. So that means that no matter what you, when you look at your life, and you go, boy, I have royally blown it. You are not too far gone that you cannot be redeemed. Not only is that grace there for uh, salvation, but it is also there for service. Because he says, I thank him who gives me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Now, grace does not appear here in this particular sentence. But Paul would be the first to admit that it was God's grace that gave him strength to do the work of the ministry that he did. Because anything we do for him, it's by his grace. And God's abundant grace will strengthen us as we work for him. And we do whatever that is he's called us to do. He will strengthen us by His grace, to do whatever it is He's called us to do. Another, I was thinking about another great example of this. Is, I mentioned him earlier, is Jeremiah. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 1, there's some verses I want us to read here. Jeremiah was a young man when God called him to do something that, in Jeremiah's eyes, was beyond him. And yet, what we're going to see is God's going to tell him, don't, don't, don't you worry about who you think you are. You just focus on who I am. Because God says, I will do these things through you. So in Jeremiah 1, uh, Jeremiah, it says, Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. You see, God had said, Jeremiah, there's a message you need to go give. And it's going to be a message that people really don't want to hear. I know exactly how he feels on that one. Because there's times you have to stand up in this pulpit and give truth when you know people don't want to hear that. But you have to do it anyway. And so he had told Jeremiah, there is a message you have to take. And that was what, and so Jeremiah says, oh, Lord, I, I, I can't. I'm just, I'm, I'm I'm a youth. But the Lord said, in verses, uh, beginning in verse 7 through 10, But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth. For to all to whom I send, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put, on, uh, put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. In other words, Jeremiah, I'm going to give you everything you need to do everything I've called you to do. And so what happens then after these verses uh, uh, if you continue in chapter 1, so, so uh, uh, God asks two questions to Jeremiah. He says, what do you see? Two different times. And, and Jeremiah gives him the answer of what he sees. The Lord explains what that means. And then you come to verses 17 through 19 that I want us to see. He says, but you dress yourself for work. Arise and say to them everything that I've that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I, behold, I make this day a fortif uh, excuse me, behold, I make you, Jeremiah. This is God speaking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, Jeremiah today I make you a fortified city, an iron pillar, bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests. And the people of the land, they will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. 
That is God's grace in action. It's an action. And what God did for Jeremiah, what God did for Paul, what God did for every believer, He will do for us as His kids. That if we're in Christ, He will give us the grace to do His service. So what service has He called you to? Because it doesn't matter how old you are, how experienced or inexperienced you may be. God calls all of His kids to serve. So what's he calling you to serve in? In what capacity is he telling you to serve? Because what he tells us is your grace, that his grace is sufficient. A fourth thing we see is God's comforting grace. This brings us right to the verse I just kind of paraphrased, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, so the context of 2 Corinthians 12 is that the Apostle Paul had been given revelations, unbelievable revelations by the Lord. He even says in verse 4, he says, quote, And he, he was speaking of himself, but he doesn't say me, but rather he says he. He says, And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. I mean, he had said, the Lord gave him this, this, he just shared with Paul some things that Paul just simply said, they just, it just can't be repeated. And then what we see Paul say in verse 7 and 8, he says, And so because of these things, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So so think about, so, so Paul had seen all these things. God had revealed all the, whatever those things was, we weren't, we're not told, but whatever they were, they must have been unbelievable. So much so that those revelations could have, could have caused Paul to become conceited. Well, let me tell you what God shared with me. Oh, wait, I can't. But he shared it with me. Conceit. So he says, because of that, this thorn in the flesh was given to me. And that brings us back to verse 9 that we just read. So so Paul says, I I went to the Lord and I pleaded with him and said, Lord, would you just take this from me? And God doesn't take it away. But what God does say in that is he says, my grace is sufficient for you. It is to help you with this thorn. And this grace for Paul was a comforting grace. This comforted Paul. Because he goes on to say, 9 and 10, he says, Therefore, after this reassurance by the Lord, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So for the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak... Then I am strong. God's grace was sufficient for Paul. God's grace is sufficient for us. It is sufficient for us in our weaknesses. And as we think about our own weaknesses, and we all have them, The comforting grace of God says, in your weakness, 
you will see my strength. Not our strength, because it's our weakness. We have weaknesses. But in our weaknesses, we see his strength. Lastly, is God's everlasting grace. We come back to Ephesians 2.7. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So the question is, what are the ages to come? Well, that would depend on how you define the end times, which we're not going to get into. But there's a couple of different ways you can interpret uh, uh, there's a phrase that we see in the New Testament, uh, this age and the age to come. And there's a couple of ways that that is interpreted, um, which we won't bother with right now. But here's what we do know. The age to come definitely does include eternity. Right? That's like, that's, that's a given. And so what we saw earlier uh, in eternity was, was God's immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness. And that He's going to show us that. But now what the focus is, what I want you to see is that this kindness that He's going to show us is for what? It is forever. It's for all eternity. Forever and ever and ever and ever. That in that place when we are with God in His presence and He is, presence, and, and he is showing us his, his kindness to us that is immeasurable. That, it, that It's just going to be unbelievable how kind He is. He says, listen to me, it's forever. Isn't that a great problem? Man, it just with 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 all the unkind things that people can do to us today and say things to us and oh my word is not social media like the worst of just it's just like horrible of what people say on the internet. And it's because they're not face to face, by the way. You can write anything on a screen. It's much different when you're face to face with that person. As much unkindness as there is in the world, just think there is a place, there is a time coming when there will be no more unkindness. And it will be nothing but the graciousness, the kindness of God. And what a wonderful promise that eternity holds for us. And God shows us, He gives us just, uh, He just gives us a little bit, I think, of those things now. And as we experience God's goodness, as we experience that kindness that He has for us now, it just shows us that, wow, what will it be like when we're truly in His presence forever? It's going to be unbelievable. Literally, words will not be able to describe it. When you read through Revelation and you read John's words, or not just John, not just John, but you know, there's other places that talks about eternity. They were using, they were, they, they gave us the, the the best they had to try to describe it. And it's the words that God wanted them to give us to describe it, right? Because we believe in the inspiration of Scripture. But I, I'm not sure those, that there are human words that's going to be able to describe what it is like when we see Him face to face. So we've seen, hopefully we've seen God's amazing grace, that it is a great grace, it is a redeeming grace, it is an abundant grace, it is a comforting grace, and it's an everlasting grace.
So what is your need today? What is it? I want to tell you that God's grace can meet that need. If you need salvation, he offers it. He extends his hand of grace in salvation. If you're a believer here and you've drifted from the Lord and you have sin in your life or you're just not where you need to be with the Lord, his grace extends to you today. If you feel like you, you, that you want to serve the Lord and you're just not like, I just don't know how I could serve him. I don't, there, there, there's things he's, that I, I feel like I should maybe try or do, but I'm just not sure I can do it. Can I just tell you that God's grace says you can. So what's your need today? God's grace says I can meet it if you'll just surrender to it. Let me get you to stand. With every head bowed and every eye closed for just a minute, I'm going to ask our musicians to come. For just a second, if you're here today, and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Again, His grace extends to you. It is a gift. It is the gift of salvation. And that gift can only be given if you're willing to receive it. So what that means is in order for you to receive it, you, just, you have to understand that you're a sinner. And that you've committed sin. And that that sin has separated you from the Father. And that the only one that can bring you back is Jesus Christ. That the only way you can have eternal life, the only way that if you used to close your eyes in death and you used to open them into God's presence, the only way that's going to happen is by repenting of sin, turning from it, and turning to Jesus Christ by faith if you have never done that and you, you say Michael I understand that I need Jesus as my Savior and Lord that I have not repented of my sin I know I've not I know I, I don't have eternal life I don't I don't have Jesus if that's you today I just want you to know that you can repent and you can place your faith in Christ and you can leave here today knowing that you have eternal life that your sins are forgiven that as far as the east is from the west, that God has cast them away. If you'll just place your faith and trust in Jesus. So if you're here today and say, Michael, I understand that I need salvation in Jesus. Would you just remember me when you pray? Just, it's just acknowledging that you understand that you need Christ. If that's you, can I get you to just put your hand up and, write, and put it right back down real quick? Christian, let me ask you, how's your walk with Christ? How's your walk with Christ? Are you walking with Him daily? Are you truly surrendered to Him? Is He really the Lord of your life? There's, there's some things I know that's in my life that I know I need to repent of and I have not. Or may, maybe I'm just not as, I'm not as close to the Lord as I, I used to be. I used to, well, I just, I can feel His presence every day and I just, it's, and, and now He just feels distant. I just want to tell you that His grace is here for you. going to force it. So believer, if that's you today, if I've described you, can I get you to slip your hand up and put it right back down and say, that's me. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty.
here's my encouragement to you. My encouragement to you is today, would you come back to Him? Would you come back to Him? I'm going to pray. And I know you can do it where, where you stand. I understand that. But there's, there's, it's, it's interesting that in the, in the Scriptures we do find that there's moments when, when there's altars. And, and, and at that moment when those, when those altars are bit, bit built, there, there's prayer that goes on and there's forgiveness that is found. And there, it's, it's something about humbling ourselves. And, and even in that physical posture when we kneel, we're, we're humbling ourselves before Him. So as I pray today, I know you may think, well, well, what will people say or what will people think or anything else? And I'm just going to tell you, they're going to think anything. And the reason is because we've all been there. We've all been in that place where maybe we felt spiritually dry or, or maybe we just, it, it just, we, we allowed some things to come into our life when we knew it didn't need to be there. We made choices that that wasn't right. They're sinful. And and when we make those sinful choices, we have to repent. Because if we feel spiritually dry and we know there's sin in our life, that's why we're dry. So if you're here and maybe there's sin in your life, but maybe there's just, maybe you just got away from the Lord and, and you just, you're not where you know you need to be. And as I pray, I want to invite you to come and kneel at an altar. And whatever that is in your life, just surrender it to Jesus. Because His promise is, my grace is waiting for you. Let's pray. If you need to come, please come. There's some already coming. Father in heaven, in this place and we thank you for that Lord we know right now that you're definitely dealing with hearts and you're dealing with lives and Lord maybe you're calling some of your children home and, and Lord I just thank you so much for that and, and Lord for, for, for whoever needs to come I just ask Lord you just help them to see their needs to step out and come knowing that your grace is sufficient Father I pray today for those that came and those who lifted hands Lord we just thank you that your grace extends to us have things that we go through and there's things that we battle and and Lord there's just times when we have to be reminded of your great grace so Lord we just stop to say thank you for that Lord if there is one who needs salvation today and they have not responded Lord how I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict their hearts and their lives help them see their need for Christ. And Father, before they lay their head on a pillow tonight, that they'll repent and place Jesus and ask Jesus to be their Savior and Lord. So Lord, we just again thank you for this day and for your blessings. Thank you for your word and how it speaks to us. Thank you for grace. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much being with us today. Come back and be with us this evening, 6 o'clock. I hope you can make it back uh, and be with us. All right, I'm going to ask Brother Bill Van Winkle if he will close us in prayer, please.